Look at Daniel chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. I want to read just a few passages there. After this, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong, and it had large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet, and it was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. While I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little one, came up among them. And three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it. And behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth uttering great boasts. Look at verse 11. Then I kept looking because of the sound of the boastful words which the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body was destroyed and given to the burning fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but an extension of life was granted to them for an appointed period of time. Turn to chapter 8. Verse 5. While I was, I was observing, behold, a male goat was coming up from the west over the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground, and the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. He came up to the ram that had the two horns, which I had seen standing in front of the canal, and rushed at him in his mighty wrath. I saw him come beside the ram, and he was enraged at him, and he struck the ram and shattered his two horns, and the ram had no strength to withstand him. So he hurled him to the ground and trampled on him. And there was none to rescue the ram from his power. Then the male goat magnified himself exceedingly. But as soon as he was mighty, the large horn was broken. And in its place there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. Out of one of them came forth a rather small horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the beautiful land. It grew up to the host of heaven and caused some of the host and some of the stars to fall to the earth, and it trampled them down. It even magnified itself to be equal with the commander of the host, and it removed the regular sacrifice from him, and the place of his sanctuary was thrown down. And on account of transgression, the host will be given over to the horn along with the regular sacrifice, and it will fling truth to the ground and perform its will and prosper. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another, another holy one said to that particular one who was speaking, How long will the vision about the regular sacrifice apply? While the transgression causes horror, so as to allow both the holy place and the host to be trampled. He said to me, For 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the holy place will be properly restored. When I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it, and behold, standing before me was one who was like a man. And I heard the voice of a man between the banks of the Uli, and he called out and said, Gabriel, give this man an understanding of the vision. So he came near to where I was standing, and when he came, I was frightened and fell on my face. But he said to me, Son of man, understand that the vision pertains to the time of the end. Now, while he was talking with me, I sank into a deep sleep with my face to the ground. But he touched me and made me stand upright. He said, Behold, I am going to let you know what will occur at the final period of the indignation, for it pertains to the appointed time of the end. The ram which you saw with the two horns represents the kings of Media and Persia. The shaggy goat represents the kingdom of Greece. And the large horn that is between his eyes is the first king. The broken horn and the four horns that arose in its place represent four kingdoms which will arise from his nation, although not with his power. In the latter period of their rule, when the transgressors have run their course, a king will arise, insolent and skilled in intrigue. His power will be mighty, but not by his own power. 
and he will destroy to an extraordinary degree and prosper and perform his will. He will destroy mighty men and the holy people. And through his shrewdness, he will cause deceit to succeed by his influence. He will magnify himself in his heart, and he will destroy many while they are at ease. He will even oppose the prince of princes, but he will be broken without human agency. The vision of the evenings and mornings which has been told is true, but keep the vision secret, for it pertains to many days in the future. In past weeks, as we've studied chapters 7 and 8, we've seen the context of these chapters and we've seen connectedness of these chapters. And I want to continue to show us that context and its connectedness. We're looking at these chapters together because they have parts to them that have some uh, separateness and yet, at the same time, the parts make up a whole of the context of the prophecy that is given by Daniel and the visions that were given to him. In that connectedness uh, and in its context, we've already noted something very important. There's a sense of history already taken care of. For us, it's past. But for the time of Daniel, he's looking at something future. And yet at the same time, we've seen these things unfold in a way to us that as they've unfolded, we ought to recognize how historic it really is that Daniel could tell of these four major nations and these multiple rulers. He could tell of them speak of them in a way before they ever came. I have one overarching theme this morning that I want us to pay close attention to as we look at this. Daniel has two visions with two little horns and two antichrists. The plural is important there. Daniel has two visions with two little horns and two antichrists. I get that S in there really good because I want you to get it, okay? My enunciation class and diction class is working. Christs. <laughs> Under that one main theme, letter A, two visions regarding multiple known historic earthly realms. Two visions regarding multiple known historic earthly realms. Now I'm not going to spend much time on this because we've already discussed it, but I've got to remind you of this so that you see where I'm headed and the connectedness of these two chapters. In previous settings, we've already shown in chapter 7 and chapter 8, both chapters mention Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. We've shown them in their contexts, in these visions. We've also seen in these chapters, and especially in chapter 8, but we've seen Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar and his successors, Medo-Persia, Cyrus and his successors, Greece, Alexander the Great and his successors, and that'll be a little bit of a focus today, and then Rome, the... Caesar and his successors. And that'll be a little bit of a focus today because that's the context of where we're headed. These four nations, their great rulers, and these successors are a part of these visions. Now you say, well, there's got to be something else a part of it. Well, that's true. And we'll deal a little bit with that at the end this morning. And then next time, we're going to deal with some other things that talk about some future uh, events as well. But this context is very important to us because it sets everything up for all that's going to be said through the rest of Daniel's prophecies. So we see these four main nations and their successors and rulers. Now, chapter 7 is interesting because 
a real main focus of chapter 7 comes in verses 7 and 8 where there's a real emphasis on Rome. When we get to chapter 8, it's like there's this microscope brought in and you have an emphasis on Medo-Persia and then Greece. Those two distinctions are important to understanding the little horns. Now, I got a pastor friend of mine. Uh, when I talk to him and I've been preaching through Daniel, he says, oh, so you're still talking about horns and goats. I said, yes, we're still talking about horns and goats. Well, these little horns are important. But a lot of times people want to put a far future instance on them before they understand the near future and to see the context of them. So letter B, two little horns representing multiple known historic earthly rulers. Two little horns representing multiple known historic earthly rulers. Well, that means who is the little horn in chapter 7? We look back at chapter 7, we have to note in verse 8, it says, while I was contemplating the horns. Now, what horns is he contemplating? He's contemplating the beast with the ten horns. So he's looking back. The beast with the ten horns represents Rome. So this little horn has something to do with Rome. We have to recognize this ten-horned beast is the Roman Empire, and that means that Daniel's contemplation of this little horn is connected to the Roman Empire. Because he says, while I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little one, came up among them. And three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it. And behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth uttering great boasts. Well, here we have in Daniel chapter 7, as we've stated previously, there's always a little bit in Daniel 7, this broader context of looking at kingdoms. There's a little bit of a focus on kings or rulers, but there's really a focus on kingdoms. That's kind of the broader sense. Chapter 8 focuses in a little bit more. It still has the four nations in, in its context, but it focuses in a little bit more on the rulers themselves. And so when we're going to deal with chapter 7, we have to consider that context. There's a broadness here to these kingdoms. So who is this little horn going to be? Well, if the ten-horned beast represents the Roman Empire, the little horn, as Calvin says, it indicates the very Caesars themselves, the whole group. It's connected to Rome, okay, the empire. And I think John Calvin's right here. The sense of these, these uh, ten horns is the whole of the Roman Empire and this one little horn rising up. And you remember the Roman Empire, it existed before the Caesars. When you first hear of uh, Caesar Augustus in uh, B.C. 31, about there, um, well, ro the Roman Empire had existed before that. And it has existed as a republic. It was mainly kind of the people's republic in a sense. There was a law and there was senate and the Senate kind of ran things, and it was the people. And this was born out of kind of a, uh, a Greek view of government. All right? Well, when the Caesars come along, they take that view of government and turn it on its head because after a while, a republic starts to move toward pure democracy and mob rule. And so what happens when there's mob rule is there becomes a vacuum for leadership. And somebody's going to fill that vacuum. And this is what Caesar Augustus does, uh, Octavian. He fills that vacuum and he, he uses the idea of the republic against itself to say, I'm going to help you regain the republic. And really what he was doing was lifting himself to all authority. So when he did that, he ushered in the rule and the reign of the Caesars, all of his successors. 
And this becomes the little horn in Daniel 7 that, or d- that Daniel 7 is speaking of is the rule of these Caesars. It's very well known that the Caesars were those who boasted of deification. This is what they promoted to the Roman Empire was that they, there were to be statues made of these Caesars. They were to be worshipped. Well, these are the the great boasts of the Caesars, that they were gods in and of themselves. So we see a sense of this little horn being the Caesars in Daniel chapter 7. And over a period of time, these Caesars rule and reign in Rome, and Rome flourishes for a little while. And then after a while, it begins to downgrade. And then it's real just degradation and sinfulness. We were having a discussion the other night. Some some of our men were discussing the the context of the book of Romans and looking at Romans chapter 1 and thinking of, as one, one of our men brought up the idea of thinking of Paul writing that to the church in Rome and the degradation that's going on in the culture Paul's already saying, you're headed this way, it's there, and then the outworkings of that, it takes about 450 years or so for the whole culture to just implode. Well, that's a part of this prophecy here. What the Caesars do is they become more and more perverse. Their leadership is perverse. By the time you get to uh, Claudius and Nero, they're, they're pedophiles. They're they're perverse men. The things that they would do with others and even children, it's just grotesque and awful. But it's because they had become gods to themselves and they were calling on people to worship them. And ultimately, as verse 11 predicts and shows, the beast was slain and its body was destroyed and given to the burning fire. Now, there's a sense in which, remember, this is past history for us. It's future history for Daniel. In verse 12, as for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but an extension of life was granted to them for an appointed period of time. Each one of these beasts, each one of these, these nations, these kingdoms, had an appointed time that they would rule and reign. And we discussed that in detail already earlier. But this little horn, the Caesars of Rome, it got to exist a longer time. So this is all past history for us, but future history that Daniel's predicting, this is what's going to happen. And if you go read about the Roman Empire, its existence uh, it, from, from the time it began as this little, uh, little bitty small group of, of nation states to its growth, and its power in the time of the Caesars, and its downgrade and fall, you're looking at approximately about a 1,000 years, somewhere in there. Right here in Daniel, that's being predicted and told that this is what's going to happen. And that's exactly what takes place. Now, the Caesars are ultimately undone Uh, by their own sinfulness and the culture of Rome is undone by its own sinfulness and that's why Paul writes to Rome and says when you just go this far this perverse it's over it's over and that's what happens well so we ask the question who is the little horn in chapter 7 we would say it's the Caesars as a whole Well, who's the little horn in chapter 8? Well, if you turn to chapter 8, verses 5 through 8 give us the context of the male goat arises and he comes and he he shatters and tramples on the ram. Now, the ram is Medo-Persia and uh, this male goat is Greece. This is Alexander the Great. Now, 
as we want to think of Alexander as ruler of Greece, we have to recognize that he came on the scene very quickly, conquered predominantly most of the known uh, Middle Eastern and Western world um, in a short period of time, and then he dies, not by the sword necessarily. Um, once he dies, he dies very young, and we really don't know how he died. But after he died, there were four successors, four. Scripture in two places in Daniel, in chapter 7 and chapter 8, tells us about these four successors. Here in chapter 8, it says, But as soon as he was mighty, the large horn was broken, speaking of that Alexander, and in its place there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. Now that's an understanding what took place with these four rulers took over four regions north South, east, west. They were uh, those who had been under Alexander and they took over and ruled these regional areas of the world. So there's one great horn. That horn's broken. Alexander then arises on the goat four horns. That's the four successors. And then verse 9 says... Out of one of them, speaking of the four horns, see. So here, the two horns can't be the same individual in time, in history. Because in chapter 7, it's relating to Rome and the ten horn beast. In chapter 8, this little horn has something to do with the male goat, which... Daniel, is, it's revealed to him that the male goat is who? Greece. The shaggy goat represents the kingdom of Greece, verse 21. So this little horn is someone different. Because it arises out of the four horns that succeeded Alexander the Great. Well, one... One writer says, scholars agree that this little horn represents the eighth ruler. Now, I'm not going to say all of these names correct. And you all know that I, I work hard at my pronunciation. You all know that. Some of you have been around here a while. I take that seriously. But I've learned over time that not all of these names are pronounced the same way. So even if I think I'm pronouncing the right way, I always have somebody that says to me, well, that's not how it's pronounced. Okay, so I'll just go ahead and say to you, I won't pronounce it the correct way. And that solves it for everyone normally uh, that, that may want to think about that. Scholars agree that this little horn represents the eighth ruler of the Seleucid Greek Empire. And his name is Antiochus or Antiochus, the fourth Epiphanes. Now, why is that figure important? Well, first of all, we need to note his background and how he arose to power. If he's the little horn that's written of in Daniel 8, 9 through 14, we need to know why he's important, but we need to know a little bit about his background. Well, you have to recognize these four horns, what takes place is among those four leaders and rulers, one of these empires is the Seleucid Empire. And the Seleucids, um, they really came to power because they drove out the Ptolemies. Now, you may have heard of the Ptolemies. They're the leaders of Egypt. And this was one of those four regions to the south. Okay? Now, it's not pronounced uh, probably correctly, but the Ptolemies starts with a P, P-T-O, but I don't think it's Ptolemies. Um, so the Ptolemies, they rose to power in that southern region, but after a while they were taken over by the Seleucid. The Seleucid king was Antiochus III, and as he took over that southern region and kicked out the Ptolemies, 
on his way back, he decides, you know what? I want to go to Jerusalem here, and I want to just kind of kick this whole temple thing out, and I want to Hellenize, or I want to make these Jews more Greek-minded. Well, as he tries to do that, of course you know the Jews didn't like that very well, and they revolted. And they revolted so much that although they were crushed at the time, Antiochus III just kind of said, you know what, I'm going to go on to some other things. And he, in 187, it was like, I'm done. But what happens after his death is, is his son comes to power. And his son, the first son, only reigns for just a little while. Because in good fashion, he's assassinated. You know, these rulers, they really love each other. They really see the love of God in all these rulers. He's assassinated. Well, he has this brother who it's not really known for sure, but it's thought that he had something to do with the assassination. Hmm? You think? He is very zealous in his ways. He's very zealous in his dad's ideas. And his name is Antiochus IV Epiphanes. And he says, you know what? I don't like that my dad didn't get his way in Jerusalem, so I'm going to go back and I'm going to try to Hellenize these Jews. As one writer says, the, Jew, the Jews revolted again, leading to what we know now as the Maccabean Revolt or the Maccabean Wars of 167 to 160 B.C. Now, what did Antiochus try to do? Well, he banned Sabbath observance and he banned the practice of circumcision. He also ordered that a statue of Zeus be erected in the temple court courtyard. He even, even condemned the sacrificial system of the Jews and he started making his priests sacrifice to the statue of Zeus on the altar of the temple. The Jews were so enraged that this set off three years of war in a serious fashion because it came to a place to where when one of these priests of Israel was commanded to sacrifice to, to Zeus, he revolted and he killed the priest of Zeus. And when he killed that priest of Zeus, it goes nuts. Well, you can see how Antiochus would be this little horn that came up out of the four horns. Because he fits. In his ideology, he made himself to be a god because he was saying, by worshiping Zeus, you're worshiping me. What does it say of the little horn here that grew up of, out of one of the four horns? It said, it grew up to the host of heaven and caused some of the host and some of the stars to fall on the earth and it trampled them down. It even magnified itself to be equal with the commander of the host. And it removed the regular sacrifice from him. And the place of his sanctuary was thrown down. Antiochus IV was one who sought to replace God so that he would be worshipped. It takes a lot of moxie. I want you to think about it. Go back to what Robin read in Psalm 50 and think about Robin's comments. In Psalm 50, when God turns and says, and you the wicked... You thought I was like you, but I'm not. What does it say of a man, even of a great ruler, who can get so far off base that he can say, 
you know what? I am likened to God. And you shall worship me as you would worship Zeus. Just a tidbit of information and a reminder. These Maccabean Wars that took place 167 to 164, this is the celebration today that the Jews hold of Hanukkah, is remembering these wars. Sadly for the Jews, they have not recognized that Antiochus, nor the Caesars, were simply all that had to be overcome. They looked purely at a national sense of things instead of recognizing a greater perspective. If these two little horns represent two different earthly known historical figures, or if they're shown to be that, then what do they represent? What do the little horns represent in both of these chapters? Well, I'm reminded of 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. John wrote, Children, it is the last hour, and just as you heard, that Antichrist is coming. Even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. Recognize John wrote shortly this letter shortly before the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. He recognized a future antichrist singular and he recognized past and present antichrists, plural. John is connected very well to Daniel's writing here because you have to understand that John himself witnessed the reign of some of the Caesars. The Caesars ruled before, during, and after the life of John. As one writer notes, from AD 30 to AD 311, a period in which 54 emperors ruled the empire, only about a dozen took the trouble to harass Christians. And furthermore, not until Decius in 249-251 did any deliberately attempt an empire-wide persecution. And yet it is noted very well that in the time of John, Claudius and Nero both persecuted Christians. Although it was not empire-wide, although it was not an eradication movement, they were still persecuted because Christianity would not bow to the Caesars. And when they would not bow to the Caesars, they would persecute these people who were called people of the way, believing only in Jesus Christ. And John witnessed those Caesars. That's how he could write, Even now, many Antichrists have appeared. He's recognizing something past and present. But it's also this same... John that saw the beast of Rome in Revelation 13, 5 through 8. Turn with me to Revelation real quickly just so you can see this. Good thing is Revelation is the last book of the Bible so you can get there pretty easily and find it. There's a beast from the sea in Revelation 13. And it's a beast which I saw that was like a leopard and his feet were like those of a bear. 
And then he says in verse 5, There was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies, and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. And he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, that is, those who dwell in heaven. John is living at a time recognizing what Rome is in its fullness. Rome is not just a great earthly power. It is a power seeking to overthrow the very throne of God and for them to be God themselves. As one writer notes of these passages connected to Daniel, clearly, clearly then Daniel's fourth beast and John's beast rising out of the sea are one and the same. This is Rome and its series of self-proclaimed ruling deities, i.e. Nero, who ruled from the city with seven hills, Rome, who waged war on Christ's people in a series of horrific persecutions in various portions of the Roman Empire, graphically described in the church. Eusebius spent a lot of time describing how Rome tried to stamp out the Christians. John is writing this at a time when Nero is reigning. His reign started in 54 AD and goes to somewhere about 68 AD. John recognizes the historical value of Daniel's prophecies. Before you say anything about far future, you have to understand the context of Daniel and the prophecies themselves. There is a very near future sense of what is taking place. To Daniel, this was dealing with Babylon, Medo-Persia. This is dealing with Greece, which he won't even know. And it's dealing with some Roman Empire, which is a great beast to him because he can't even identify it in his mind. And how could he? He would know nothing of what Rome would come to do. He would have little understanding of the power that Rome would be and the power that the Caesars would hold. And yet, God gave him this vision of this coming group. And he gave him this vision of this coming nation and rulers. He gives him history coming down the pipe and says, here's how it will go. In a couple of weeks or so, we'll get to the greatest understanding of the encouragement that John and Daniel both saw was the son of man. But who is it that's going to get the people of God through the Medo-Persia, the Grecian, and the Roman empires? Is it going to be all of their gods? God is saying no. Even when the little horn Antiochus Epiphanes comes and he tries to stamp out the temple and the tabernacle and its worship, I will put antichrists down. And it's God's way of encouraging people to say that when that man of sin comes, as Paul writes about, that antichrist, as Paul and John write about, when he comes, I will put him down too. There's not even a need necessarily that we always have to know who the antichrists and who the antichrist will be. It is to know that they are all around us antichrists and there is a man of sin who will be like none other, and yet he will be put down.
What hope is there for us? Two things. Recognize the historical value of Daniel's visions and prophecies. Liberals hate this stuff because they always want to say Daniel didn't write this. It was written by somebody else three or four hundred years later. Why? Because the prophecies are so good. And they run right along with history, but history that Daniel prophesied hundreds of years before it would happen. And if you don't want to believe in God, you don't want to believe that God knows all things, you don't want a, a God who will be able to say to you, I am your king and ruler, you just poo-poo the whole thing and say, you know what, Daniel didn't even write this. Well, I'm sorry he did. And it's plain from the prophecies that God gave him a vision to see what was coming down the pipe, even hundreds of years before it happened. And it explains exactly the coming of these nations, even in this apocalyptic language. Does it give us every single detail? No, but it gives us a framework to go, oh, yeah. After Alexander, there's four rulers. It's split up four ways, and history reads it and knows it and found it, and boom, it's there. We need to recognize the historical value of Daniel's visions and prophecies. Don't do away with this because some scholar today Well, we can't believe that. Well, you can believe a lot of other things, like we're primordial soup. <laughs> the evidence is clear. Even secular historians have put together a framework that shows these prophecies have value. That's why they want to say they were written after, even after, after Antiochus, some of them. They want to say they were written in 130 B.C. instead of between the period of, uh, of 600 and 540. Uh, they, they want to tear all that down because it fits the framework and it puts them under the judgment of God. But secondly and lastly, recognize the remarkable encouragement of these prophecies to God's people. At the time, God is saying, Antichrists are coming. They're marching down the pipe. They're going to hate you. But don't you worry. I am sovereignly in control. Because not only will I be able to defeat the enemy... I'm the one who's ordered the work of the enemy in its purpose and way to bring about my goal for my people. And I want you to trust in me and not your own understanding. That's an encouragement for them then and for us now. All of these nations we see around us, every ruler who's risen to his place is all orchestrated by the God who created all things. And he's put it there purposefully for the good of his people because he's going to grow us in times of trial, in times of tribulation. He's going to strengthen us that we would trust in him in times of not only difficulty, but in times of grace and mercy. Even the point that we can see that the awfulest of rulers is one that God is using ultimately to bring about his glory throughout all of time and space and history. If God could tell Daniel not only of Antiochus IV, but he could tell Daniel that there was going to be a line of rulers in this Roman Empire and 
that he would ultimately deal with them as well. What ruler will not be dealt with by God? Show me a ruler that God does not sovereignly deal with. There are no accidents. In the scheme of all of heaven and earth, God has ordered all things for his purpose, according to his will, and for his glory alone. To him be all the glory. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask your mercy upon us. So often our minds are troubled. Troubled in ways that are biblically unhealthy about the world. Lord, we ask that you give us biblically minded well-founded thoughts about the unrighteousness of this world and yet that we would not lose our trust in you. Where our joy and our peace has subsided over your rule and reign and we have focused on all of the terror and the difficulty, will you restore the joy and peace of our salvation? That we would see and know that you are ruling and reigning. Will you give us hearts and minds to act accordingly as we live in this world Live according to your sovereignty, trusting in you, glorying in you. Even when trial may come, give us hearts to trust in you. We ask your mercy upon us as we come to the time of your table. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.